Okay. Uh, yeah, hi, guys. Uh, I'm Sanjay Kapoor. I'm the company I'm presenting is uh, Sealmatic India. Uh, basically, a BSC SME listed company. Uh, it used to have an earlier lot size of 600. Now it's, uh, you know, come down to 300 and it's 150 as of now. And I've shared the share price as of closing yesterday along with the market cap. Um, uh, basically, this uh, company is promoted by a gentleman called Omar Balwa and uh, his co-partner Hanif Chaudhary. Uh, they have an association that goes back real uh, far behind. They both earlier were working together with Bergman, uh, which they are the Indi the uh, the part. Uh, uh, Mr. Balwa was basically the Indian promoter of uh, Bergman. Uh, three decades is their experience in this line, and um, uh, when unfortunately Bergman decided after being taken over in Germany that they didn't want any partners in the trade with them. So uh, Mr. Balwa's family had to sell off and uh, he was basically, uh, you know, idling time thinking of what to do when Hanif, who he had, was in fact among his first employees at uh, Bergman India, from a, you know, from a foreman level person, grew up to be the vice president of the conglomerate here. And uh, he's... Uh, Hanif came to him with the idea that let's start the mechanical seal business. And uh, from my, I have in fact met Umar Balwa in a meeting at uh, at his factory on, on the 12th of January. And uh, what Balwa ji said was that uh, I told Hanif, you know, Hanif, we aren't 22 anymore. Why would you want to do this business, which is really, really difficult, you know? And uh, Hanif was like, no, we need to do something that you know, we need to do something that leaves behind a legacy. And he says, okay, what is it that you want from me? He says, you come on board with me, 50%, you know, each of us as partners. So from there, they started the journey again with Sealmatic. Uh, they have, uh, they were basically only into exports and just around COVID is when they entered the Indian market, maybe just after COVID. Uh, Mr. Hanif has two sons, both of whom are involved actively in the business. Uh, and the thing is that what they do is they make sure that the training of the key people in their uh, organizations always done overseas, you know, in they've tried to do it in clients' factories. So Mr. Hanif's elder son, his training has been done with uh, their clients in uh, Germany. Uh, also, what they've done now is they've got a nephew of Mr. Balwa, uh, Mr. Imran, who now oversees the North uh, America operations based basically out of Houston. Uh, the business overview, basically, uh, uh, Sealmatic is an ISO 9001-2015 uh, company. Uh, they, the, the kind of certifications they got is amazing, you know. So they have, uh, this is a business where basically you're selling technology. Your raw material cost really is immaterial. They are basically selling technology because the mechanical seal is such an important component of, you know, a bigger thing like a pump because it's stopping the leakage. It's stopping the mixing of the two fluids, you know, with one stationary and one rotatory part. So they, it is, it is again, a critical element part of a business. Uh, they are product profiles. You know, if you can you see, I'm not going to be able to tell you anything different than what is there already on their website. So, uh, on their website, on Google, you could just get the whole list of products that they're doing. I've put it up in the PPT. Uh, they're all niche products. The user industry is huge. So it's oil and gas, refineries, petrochemicals, chemicals, pharma. Uh, anywhere where there's a pump, anywhere where there's a rotating part, they are into it. Uh, they are among the only two companies in the world that have got a nuclear seal, seal approval, the other being LNT. Uh, they've been able to get... Uh, the defense approvals, they've been able to get uh, approvals for Marine. They've now got the approval for uh, the Kuwait oil. They've got approval from uh, the ADNOC, that's the Abu Dhabi uh, oil. Uh, so they, as a company, are very well uh, entrenched in this business, uh, you know, given their association with Bergman. And that can be seen even uh, on a factory visit. So when we went to the factory, the kind of discipline, the kind of uh, 
uh, uh, SOPs that they work with is absolutely on par with probably what you'd see, you know, in the Western world. Uh, what the kind of business model that Sealmatic has is basically, uh, it's, you know, broken up into two kind of parts, categories, actually. So one is an OEM where, uh, where the pump and the pump manufacturers and equipment manufacturers whom they supply to. And the second is where they do it to the end user. Uh, the end user is when he's fitted with a, with the seal, you know, his, his equipment is fitted with the seal of Sealmatic. Uh, they have an annuity. So basically 25, 30 years, which is the normal life of a seal is where the annuity keeps coming in. The normal annuity kicks in about two to three years after having supplied the seal, because that's the time it takes to, uh, uh install the pump and, you know, uh, the the kick in of the of the pump and the start the things to start. Uh, in fact, in the now uh, they had just installed about uh, about a fifteen crore project they are installing in Mongolia, which should be delivered within this year, and they will uh, as per the con call by in another three years they'll start generating two million dollars worth of annuity from that alone. Uh, they have, you know, they raise contracts which are fixed for a year, maybe two years down the line. But the business and, you know, the business model is even the escalations fortunately don't affect them. Because as Mr. Balwa says that I sell technology, I do not, uh, you know, the raw material cost doesn't really affect me because they're working at about 70, 80% margins gross. Uh, in some uh, high-end seals that cost as high as two crores, it's, uh, it's even up to 80, 90%. You know, so if when someone asked them, do you are you able to pass on the cost of the raw material? He said it's not really significant for me because it's not too much of a part of uh, my overall product. Uh, the customer base that they have is the who's who of the of the industry, especially in uh, oil and gas. They've got Reliance, they've got Sulza. They they are the only guys approved by BHEL. Uh, they've got as they are also got they're exporting to over fifty three countries. Uh, and uh, in exports, they are able to sell under their own name, you know, so they've got clients in all the parts of the world. And these countries that they consider export don't even include Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. So that just keeps adding to the list, you know. Uh, the peers, the guys who are competitors with them, they, uh, they can, there are three big boys in this industry. One is Bergman, where uh, Eagle Bergman, where Mr. Umar Balwa started out in India. The other is FlowSurf, and the third one is John Kane. Uh, in our interaction with Mr. Balwa, we were told that uh, FlowSurf now is not able to meet deliveries. They have problems with their, uh, you know, with their vendors. They have, uh, uh, they are not really up to the mark. In fact, they're not even approved now by BHEL. So that's where the order is also moving in towards them. Uh, but the, the the world market is yet controlled about 75% by these of mechanical seizures controlled by these three big boys. Uh, when someone asked Mr. Balwa what percentage, you know, of uh, the market does he control? So he said it was, you know, because that the fact that they've just started out their journey in India, which was about 2020 or, and the business really kicked off at 2022, he said it was too early to put a figure. Uh, but he also did say that every incremental business that now is coming up in India is 15% of that is what we want to get because other than them, there are not really any uh, known or branded uh, mechanical seal suppliers. Uh, the order book, they are projecting a 20% revenue growth year on year. They said in his con call, he said he would... Uh, you know, in three lines, his top line would be about 150 crores. Uh, the They have, in fact, added a factory at Kaman, uh, which is near Versailles. And once that factory, which should be integrated with the previously existing one at Mira Road, uh, once they are integrated, he is looking at, at about a 65% addition to the top line. Uh, he's, he's, you know, the basic thing with this business is it depends on what business mix does he want to do. Uh, if he wants to only do the end user business from his current capacity, he can do 200 crores is what he said. Uh, I'll just bring out a point here is that when we had gone to visit uh, Sealmatic, a gentleman from SR Oil was with us. 
uh, he, when we walked out of that meeting, uh, we just asked him what his feedback was regarding uh, Sealmatic. So he said that in the market, Sealmatic had a great name. And he said the kind of order pipeline that's kicking in into India, Sealmatic would not only need the common factory, but would probably need to forex their capacity. So he said that's the kind of demand and that is coming in for mechanical seals in India and with no real uh, branded or reputed players, you know, uh, he said that is, it's a huge, huge advantage to Sealmatic. The fundamental ratios I've shared, again, this I've taken off screen or so, you know, that is uh, uh, something as they, what they've done is they have written off about uh, four point some odd crores towards uh, business uh, towards business promotion here because they've participated in a lot of fairs. So uh, they've participated in Egypt. They've participated uh, in a fair in um, Houston, uh, where uh, you know which is sub considered the biggest fair. So when Mr. Balwa was asked whether these expenses would be there every year, he said uh, a lot of fairs happen once in three years. So the recurring thing is not there, and he's saying the thing was to establish our presence. So once we've got our presence established, got our, uh, you know, got our uh, field work done. We don't really need to keep participating. Uh, these are the various certifications that I mentioned earlier, you know, that they've got it uh, from uh, the defense. They've got it from Russia also. Uh, in fact, one of the triggers for them also has been the fact that uh, uh, unfortunately, due to the Russia and Ukraine war, the big three are, uh, you know, European and American based suppliers and Russia stopped, uh, uh, Russia uh, uh, was, you know, they didn't, they stopped supplying to Russia. In fact, for in the last four or five years before the war, Mr. Balwa said he had sent about 800 brochures to different companies across Russia, but didn't get a response. But the moment the war broke out between Russia and Ukraine, he's had about 12 Russians visit his factory. And that's why he had to get the certification. And that's where the business is also going to trigger in from. Uh, the other day, it was also there that the Indian oil and gas exploration offers a hundred billion opportunity. Now for every $1 billion that is invested, it gives a uh, potential for around 221 uh, pumps. So, the kind of, uh, sorry, 225 API pumps and mechanical seals. So that's the kind of opportunity they are looking at from here. Uh, and this is just one industry. Uh, the fact that he's much cheaper than, uh, you know, much cheaper than the, the seals coming from the big three, plus the fact that uh, he's got a reputation because being with Bergman, just uh, ex-Bergman, it just opens up all windows, you know, for him, you know, so anywhere he goes, he at least gets a saying, he at least gets to uh, put his presentation up. And the the advantage is now that he's got all his, uh, all his certifications in place, because if you aren't approved, you can't even get in for, uh, you know, you can't even apply for the business. Uh, this business basically is not a tender business. You know, it's like going to the customer, uh, proving your worth, showing stuff, and then you uh, then you need to, uh, then that's when you'll get the orders. So there's no tender, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, the guy who's the cheapest is going to win the order kind of, uh, you know, business here. Uh, so he was, Mr. Balwa was asked this uh, on, a, on the con call where uh, given, you know, that should he see a substantial jump in the revenues by 25 because 2022 is when he started uh, doing business in India and um, three years uh, down is what he said, you know, revenue start kicking in. Uh, Mr. Balwa has this thing, which he even told us. And in fact, we were the, when they've listed on March 1st, 2023, I went to him about 10 months later and I, we were the 66th people to go to him uh, to meet him. And, uh, Post that also, a couple of friends have gone, a couple of PMSs have gone to him. It's now well over 80, 85, uh, you know, groups that have gone to him because showing interest in his company. And he, he has this one line that he keeps saying that uh, 2026 onwards is when my Chandragupta Maurya period is going to start. 
so i asked him what it meant and he said sanjay i've laid the i've laid the basis of everything in my business we've done the hard work we supplied at uh, you know cost we supplied at under cost to get in the market to get in to uh, to supply to people uh, now my hard work will start paying from 2026 when the revenues will start kicking like he said with uh, with the mongolian uh, the example being the mongolian refinery uh he one sec again the risks in this business the risk is that what if you know he says he doesn't want it but what if the russian and ukraine wars over and orders again start going back from russia to the big 3 so that is one risk that could play out here the second risk as all, as always what if the numbers don't come play out as expected people do less uh, you know uh, do less expenses the capex uh he did though mention that you know this is not a business where you can stop the capex so whether it's covid whether it's not covid people have to keep investing for the maintenance and uh, you know keep constantly spending cap uh, money on capex for their refineries and everything so it's a risk that's there but according to him it it's really not there uh, and the other fact could be you know where the big the big chunk of this uh, revenue comes from the oil and uh, gas businesses so that is uh, that is another if there's a slowdown there that could you know lead to a slowdown in his business uh he uh, mr balwa also mentioned that the fact that you know given it's it's a sticky business because you know it's a critical element you aren't really going to change the supplier so until unless there's a major major issue you know with the seal or some there's a major problem your uh, once you're in a customer and you're in him for 25 30 years uh he so he in fact uh, said that he's told so many of his uh, uh vendors you know so many of his buyers and the guys that he supplies to the pumps who actually drive them down for price that why don't you give us a fair price because we are a tabela that's the term he used that we are a tabela why don't you just milk us you know we've got the factory we've got the know how for you in fact they do the white labeling even for ksb pumps so these are among the he is they are ready to work both ways where he says customer is the one who's going to teach me so i am not going to say no to any kind of business whether it's coming from a ksb to be an uh, oem supplier to him or whether it's you know going directly to the end user who's buying from me uh, i am ready to do both things uh, this is this is a chart that i've picked up from trading view uh, of the company since uh, little after inception um uh if you read uh, you know they've got a very very comprehensive website uh, mr balwa has written in fact his old his whole journey of the seal industry is there on the uh, from start to where he got uh, you know how he started out as a 22 year old uh, with uh, a company that his family had called ak enterprise and from there how he got into bergman how he got bergman to come here you know though he wasn't even the most favored guy to get the bergman uh, contract the first guy in line dropped off due to some reason and uh, mr balwa was the one that got bergman to india and he says that once a seal man always a seal man uh, uh he has now they now have what they called a vision 2028 and beyond so this is a this is a business that is not going to give uh, you know it it's not a business that pays immediately but yes in 2 3 years every 2 3 years is when the quantum leap starts coming uh it's a great business model that he's in uh and uh oh a great promoter uh my uh with my interaction with him see most of my things that i am talking uh, is with more out of my interaction with him because anything other than uh everything else is actually available on the website right? or is available on google i mean there's not really much that i can add in terms of numbers in terms of uh, you know business thing because everything's freely available what i can say or add is about you know regards where my interaction was with him uh in terms of promoter quality uh, the balwas are they are a very very uh, well reputed family from bombay they used to own the balwas uh, the restaurant so anybody that's you know actually been uh, in bombay south bombay especially would know their restaurant they also are 
the uh, owners of the property of Radisson in Bombay as well as the uh, Fairfield by Marriott. The properties are owned by them. So his older brother looks uh, after them. His older brother is also on the promoters. So they are yet a joint family that operates this. Uh, great promoters, great vision. Uh, you know, I, I would think that any business requires a small SME business requires the promoter's vision to drive them from where they are. So to get to 100 crores is one thing. 100 to 500 is another ball game. 500 to 1000 is another ball game. He is one promoter that I've met, you know, and I've met quite a few that has the vision even today at this 80 crore, 70 crore turnover to achieve that 1000 crore uh, thing. Because got the systems in place is very clear. They've in fact, even now in Dublin, uh, appointed a uh, ex Bergman guy who also is happens to be Indian to uh, represent them over Europe. So they've now got representation in Europe. They've got representation in the US. They have uh, representation in the Gulf. Even for the Indian business, they've got representation in Delhi, Chennai. So they've got people all over that are constantly knocking for business. Uh, very hardworking team. Uh, uh, solid, uh, you know, solid reputation. Uh, in fact, we now that uh, they, they're also planning to open an uh, office in Africa. Uh, and they know exactly what they need to do. The biggest advantage for them is having, you know, the Bergman experience, which which is actually tremendous. That is their biggest plus point is both of them, Mr. Hanif, as well as Mr. Balwa, have that Bergman uh, experience. So their way of thinking, their way of... Uh, uh, the way of uh, operating things, the way of doing things is very, very professional, very, very thorough. And uh, yep, that's about uh, my presentation. If there's anything I anybody needs to ask, I'll be glad to uh, glad to do this. Uh, regarding Sandeep, uh, Sandeep, uh, in fact, uh, the question that you asked about the DB Reality Group, so uh, when the, that was my first question, in fact, to Mr. Balwa, when I uh, when I met him, I said, "Are you related to Shahid?" Because Shahid again was uh, is a South Bombay kid where I grew up. So he was like, "We are cousins, but they have nothing. The group is different." So uh, Shahid is the one that owns DB Realities and uh, now whose name is changed. Uh, uh, and Omar Balwa, in fact, owns uh, you know. So their family was the other part. So related, yes. Uh, in the same way, uh, are they part of the same group? No, they aren't. Yes, Sanjay, you can ask. Yeah. Hi, hi. Um, I'm Sanjay. Uh, thanks for the nice presentation. Just one, uh, one, one basic question. When you say annuity, hmm. um, example, the uh, lifetime of the mission is thirty years. Correct. And and this mechanical seal goes and sits inside the machine. So as long as the machine is there, the seal has to be there. So how frequently this seal, this mechanical seal has to be replaced? Uh, um... So basically, I tell you what, how they operate is. Uh, so with when they do it with an OEM or, mm. with, or when they, sorry, when they do it in the end user, what they do, they keep the blueprint with themselves, right? So the whole blueprint of how the, how the seal has, has, uh, has been, uh, you know, has been framed. See, the seal, the kind of material used in the seal it, mm. there is a life of, of 7, 8, 10 years till where there, there's no issue of uh, things. It's just the normal, regular repairs and maintenance. Okay. The, the product that they sell is 25, 30 years because the pumps and everything last that long. Mm. So the, annual, the the funny thing is what he told us was that, you know, the even though they've, they've given, they've, they offer these guys that, you know, because what they're doing is they are having to sell sometimes at under cost. Right, they're having to sell where they don't even cover the material cost just mm. to get in. But the offer, he says that many times I've offered them that you know, give me at least cost or give me cost plus X, uh, rather than you know, pull me down so much for price, so mm. that you know, in the annuity, I can you know, you don't need to really pay me that so much going uh, you know, further. But somehow, those guys are okay to do that, so they want uh, the guy supplying it, uh, you know, the guy buying it out of them. The OEM wants it really cheap. So like where KSB and all are concerned, even Reliance for that matter, they want to squeeze them, but they're okay to pay the annuity. Whatever the reason, I couldn't fathom out. 
but these guys that's the way they are ready to operate so if someone buys this mechanical seal they have to pay every year to the um, yeah they have seal. to maintain it right because see uh, uh, any 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 this you can't uh, because like i said the blueprints with him right hmm so finally okay. you are going to have to keep paying him annuity because that that is the way this uh, industry works that is why all these guys bergman flosser hmm. john kane they've grown so big Mm. because of this annuity business no so, that, so this maintenance activity requires the silmatics uh, help so 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 they have to engage with silmatic every year they That's have to right? yeah 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 okay see this market size in india is about mm. 1900 crores as of now mm. uh, all mm. over the world it's about 5 mm. billion and expected to by 2030 roughly around 7 7 7.5 billion maybe i'm a little uh, uh i'm a little uh, off on the figures but it's somewhere around there uh yeah. so the his advantage is he's already exporting about 50 55 countries and does it under his own name uh, mm. you know whereas here where what they supply is not under their name right so if they put it to ksb it sells as ksb spam you know the seal oh okay right okay. so overseas they have a huge market and also what he told us was that i get if I, for every 1 rupee i get in india i get about 2 and a half in the gulf ah Okay. So what he's done is now that he's got the permission, see he's uh, approved by Kuwait Oil, he's approved by Abu Dhabi. So there's a huge market there. They are also going mm -hmm. into Africa because places because they had participated in a uh, 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 exhibition in uh, in Egypt. They got superb response there, and I think see he's not told me off the this that it is they are opening an office in Africa, which I assume is either Egypt or probably. Uh, you know somewhere another place where oil is this which could be nigeria i'm not sure of that mm -hmm. so even the business coming out of uh, people didn't don't realize uh, now africa can't really afford bergman can't really afford the us seals right the same way like they are coming to india for defense they are coming mm -hmm. for all things of the international standard to india so he has now a huge advantage even there so they are open uh, opening up an office in africa that's again where business starts coming in uh, mm -hmm. they spoke up his nephew in the us because again us is a huge oil and gas uh, yeah place right so mm. he's put his nephew up there that business starts coming in he's uh, opened up a guy in dublin so mm -hmm. now you know the money that they raised uh, last year they put up a plant for about 5 6 crores in this kanan which is near uh, which is near vasai that's just mm. outside bombay so the expansions are all in progress the certifications are in place you know that's the toughest part in this business is the certification like i said bhel uh, now doesn't recognize flowserve one of the top 3 suppliers because he doesn't fit into the uh, into the you know the criteria anymore okay so that really opens up the doors for him and mm. uh, yep that's how it is okay thank you thank you sir yeah and on the uh, and sort of uh, on the annuity this once you sign the contract so you have to pay the annuity right so you know it's like it's like how you uh, have a annuity contract for say the water filter in your house whether the guy whether you spoil the uh, you know whether it comes or no he'll come service it and charge you the annuity right sanjay when uh, when they supply to ksb pump etc Hmm. How the annuity business will flow to Silmatic uh, via KSB pump? It will flow. It will uh, flow via KSB. Okay, okay. So some share will go to KSB pump also. Yes, yes, yes. So which If is they... why which is why he said that his the business that the more the biggest business that he wants coming out is the direct uh, this right. Ah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that is where the mix he said uh, you know. So that is where the uh which when someone asked him on the con call you know what's the mix he saying see the mix mm -hmm. depends on what kind of business operation mm -hmm. i finally undertake do i supply to the oem or do i supply directly to the uh, this one to the end user end user so yeah. so more he supplies to the end user his his no, right now they are more see right now uh -huh. uh, in exports they are supplying to the end user because mm -hmm. they are allowed to sell under their name correct right? correct now in india because uh, like i said this they, they were only into exports they started in 2022 in india mm. right so obviously it takes time to break in but luckily uh, you know because given their quality given the kind of uh, sops and everything they follow they've now got approvals from everywhere like they are approved by bhel uh, you know in fact the uh, the nuclear certification that he's got it uh, the certification you need to go that thing has to be done in france it takes mm -hmm. about 20 lakh rupees to get that certification 
and okay. and not only in india there are only two guys in the world that have it but for you know to be a mechanical seal supplier for nuclear one is him and one is lnt mm -hmm. you know? mm. so that's the kind of that's the kind of certifications and all which is why he says you know 2026 will be my chandragupta maurya period okay you know? even lnt does this mechanical seal some part of it they do oh okay yeah. but th like i think again they must be just see this is not their main business right so mm -hmm. they are only maybe right. somewhere where they need it i very frankly didn't ask him the details that mm -hmm. how come lnt is a part of it but he did mention to us that lnt and he were the only two uh, guys that were uh, into it you know that had that had the approval see maybe other guys want to do it but the approval needs to come through mm -hmm. so and these what these guys also do is some of the uh, some of the things that they do so where you know the seals uh, they are able to do it where at 350 degrees uh, this also so they keep using for food grade also because they need specially anti corrosion seals so they are basically into all those things also you know mm -hmm. so okay. yeah okay and in fact uh, you know if someone wants very frankly i can arrange a meeting and you know to go to the factory also so you can go mm -hmm. and see that what an indian guy is capable of doing you know if if they know the sops if they know the thing you know everything is so well organized every department every see every seal is checked at every level you know we were there for like maybe 3 hours mm -hmm. so every seal is checked at every level before you know so the the, the labeling the this everything is uh, thoroughly checked uh, the kind of washing that goes in through the seal <coughs> uh, you know see i'm not such a technical guy but uh, mm. what i could see and you know and given the fact that we had a guy from sr oil with us so mm. he was also very impressed with uh, you know the processes and everything followed by them so uh, sanjay so yeah. yeah go ahead yeah no no uh, this chandra this, this yeah. chandra i have a question yeah, yeah uh, if if today um, he has um, an issue with the overall capacity due to which he needs to set up a second factory mm. then i'm also having a question related to what was asked earlier Hmm. uh why wouldn't he put his entire capacity on his direct customer business rather than going via oems and using capacity there on which he makes lesser margins and also less annuity relatively speaking so because it's also tougher no it's not always easy that the you'll get to work with the customer right see no but now, i heard what i understand is he has enough orders no no he has enough orders but understand hmm. one thing so say if ksb has won the pumps thing for some place right understand and ksb doesn't make the thing he's doing white labeling for ksb because like i said earlier also what he said is boss i i am a tabela you have to come milk me i am going to get business from everywhere wherever i get the business so wherever they get direct business that's their first preference but some places if there are contracts in place say if ksb has a contract with some refinery for the next 20 years he can't just go in and get the thing right until unless there's an a new demand for new pumps right no no i i i get that all i'm saying is uh, i'm not talking about uh, in the past maybe when he was starting off and he need, i had excess capacity that made perfect sense because you could then use his capacity to fulfill every kind of order that was coming in but now if he has enough orders on hand then he should be stepping out of the oem business right from a strategic perspective uh but see he's he's finding there's money there also right and that gives him uh, that gives him recognition right so today when he says that his pump is there on a, on a in a bhel or in a bhel plant through ksb or you know so that is kind of giving him uh, the recognition also to walk into places right that ye pump uh, ksb mein mera seal laga hai and that's mm. been working for the last x number of years so that's uh, you know okay, anyway like my understanding said, of the oem business generally is these the 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 like say K ksb or anyone like that will not typically allow them to claim the manufacturing or branding of a product which is under their brand name maybe so they're sure they will not allow people. them to create but mm. see it's it's like this if i go if even me i, I i'm i'm into garment exports i go somewhere uh -huh. i'm making the i do white labeling for most of the uh, importers in the gulf right Understand. but when i go to a new guy i tell him boss i am his supplier though he may not acknowledge it right you mm. going to say that off the this so you're going to put it out on the table right whether you can officially claim it or not understand, no, Understand. You know? yeah 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 so but a very strong story yeah huh? thanks for sharing really appreciate no see i'll i'll uh, i'll i'll tell you another thing so what happened was uh we i it, so he happens to be from south bombay i also happen to live in south bombay and it just so happened that 
I have a group of friends that we are friends from the last 50 years. And I was sitting with one of them one day and I said, yeah, you know, he was asking me, you know, tell me a story where I, I can put in money for my kid, you know, for the next two, three, four years. I said, a company called Sealmatic, brilliant, do it. So he's like, who's the promoter? I said, some one guy called uh, Umar Balwa. He says, you're saying Umar? I said, yeah. I said, you know, you're saying Umar as if you know him. He's like, uh, boss, he used to live in my building. We are friends for the last 40 years. So he dies Umar Balwa then and there. So I then asked my friend, you know, what's the reputation? You know, later uh, in a conversation, I asked that friend of mine, you know, what? He's like, brilliant family, even when they were uh, not this big, you know, as in not in this industry thing, where they were running restaurants, when they were running uh, this. So even as a human, you know, I was just trying to uh, add that part. Even as a as a guy, superb, uh, super promoter, great, uh, great person. Uh, in where, uh, when we went to meet him, in fact, I had taken my older son with me. Older son's about 22. So even now in my interaction, whenever I, you know, every time there is, uh, because I'll be very honest, I'm invested in the company. I'm invested from a lower level. That's like a disclaimer. Uh, so my son... Uh, came with us and he was very impressed that, you know, 22 year old guys come, you know, trying to figure out what is it. Every time I interact with him, you know, over some uh, certification they've got or I'll congratulate him there. He'll always ask me, how's your son doing? You know, so that's the, that's the kind of, uh, you know, so that, that attitude that he has is, is great. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, sorry, Yogesh, you need to ask something. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. You were very, very, you know, detailed you know, presentation. Uh, I was just going through Skinner, found, you know, uh, the declining ROC. So that brings into my mind, uh, who are their, you know, uh, from backend perspective, who are their suppliers? Is there is a problem from their side as well? Plus, no, see, uh, uh, yeah, okay, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Plus, you know, margins are also, you know, declining, which you mentioned elaborately that they have uh, in just previous questions. But Mostly, you know, my questions revolved around, you know, their suppliers, how much their dependency is on them. Uh, see, uh, the raw, like I told you even in my presentation, the raw material really doesn't make up much of their cost, you know. So if there's a cost escalation, uh, their margins minimum there is like 70% is what they're working on, right? Uh, so 70% margins in some places where it's high end, you know, so in the food grade things and everything where they use anti-corrosion material, it goes as high as about 80-85%. Uh, so their suppliers really don't have much of a say on, uh, you know, they, they can't, uh, they, there's not much of a hold where, where that's concerned. So uh, uh, he was also uh, asked that question in the uh, in the, in the con call. I can share the con call. I have the, this, I'll share it with Puneet, uh, where he said that, uh, you know, that four and a half uh, crores is what they had to write off or what they've shown as business promotion, which has led to, you know, lower uh, margins. Also, the fact that they've now got into the Indian business. See, uh, now that they've got into the export is giving them the money. The Indian business to break through, like I said, is sometimes just at cost. Yeah. Right? So what happens with, uh, with that part of the business, which at, as of right now, India is about 35%. He wants to bring it to 50-50 with export. Uh, so that part of the business, 35% is not, uh, you know, since 2022 till the build up to now 35%. So that is where the, that's the reason for that fall in the ROC, right? Because that Indian part, 35%, which first 100% was giving money, now 65% is giving money. Though obviously the volume is growing. Right, right. Yeah. And during your visit, uh, any any technological element you found very interesting in terms of you know supply chain or in terms of uh, you know anything which uh, was catching eye see it's a basically a technology driven business right so in terms of supply chain in terms of uh, things like that i'm not really sure see they've grown they are they started as about a 200 square foot uh, 200 square yeah 200 square foot place they've now grown it they have a very good factory at mira road They've done another one at Kanan, but that I think gets, uh, I think sometime this month is when it will become fully integrated. They had started production there, you know, the trial runs and all. Now, uh, their advantage, like I said, is the systems on what they are based. Uh, you know, coming out of Bergman, you know, you you get into his office, you get that, uh, you get that feel that, you know, you're not really in a, 
हंड्रेड परसेंट इंडियन कंपनी यू नो सो द द मशीनरीज दैट दे हैव ऑल्सो ऑल टॉप एंड सो यू कुड हैव अ मशीन यू नो दे हैव अ मशीन वेर द सील वॉशिंग टेक्स प्लेस that also is the total high end machine coming out of japan or coming out of germany you know that's the kind of things that they made sure they have not compromised on any um, uh, you know any kind of machinery or anything that they have uh, you know uh, they've put up uh, things are in order you know they've taken uh, they, they use a lot of rubber for uh, uh, i think goes into the ceiling you know so a lot of rubber is used what i found and saw there was their rubber is all stored in an air conditioned room to control the temperature i said why he says because in the heat the rubber can crack so you know they have taken care of things even you know again which is all coming from his experience with bergman right so oh, okay. so even such things that you know see maybe i'm not a, i'm not in the industry so maybe it is the norm in the industry it's just that something that it was it fascinated me you know that even these things okay. are uh, being thought of by the guys got it thank you thank you thank you so much a pleasure thank you thank you sanjay ji uh, for such a detailed presentation as well as answering questions with <laughs> full details no nee, puneet ji if anybody wants uh, if anybody wants i'll tell you what i have i have a i have the notes of uh, of the meeting that i had with him i can share that this but i'll tell you see my my notes my meeting is more like a running commentary right so i would tell you what color shirt he wore when he walked in <laughs> so and you know even given even given the kind of uh, you know stature that he has he had comes in into the meeting wearing a sealmatic t-shirt you know so that's mm -hmm. the kind of uh, association and love that he has for his company i can i'll share my notes i'll share my notes sure. of my meeting with you and uh, you can take it forward if anybody needs it it's great here yeah. sure sure thank you theek okay all right uh, Okay. Let's move to the next presentation. I think. Thanks, Sheetal. You are here. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we are able to see your screen. You can move to presentation mode. yeah yeah hey okay, good morning okay. one and all uh thank you for your time today to make it on a saturday to listen to what we've got to say uh today we are just going to make a brief effort to understand what is uh, the overall healthcare sector in india and um, what are the key growth drivers why we need to look at this sector as a whole and also one such player in the market who's uh, making great for it okay you see the overall healthcare universe cons uh, consists of hospitals see i'm going to uh, start from the basics uh, keeping uh, you know keeping the base as neutral so we understand what it involves and we go up from there so first is hospitals you have uh, you know it comprises your government hospitals and your private hospitals then you have diagnostic centers which also includes all your uh, you know um, laboratories of, uh, also includes your uh, body fluid analysis kind of a thing you have a pharma industry which is a big industry as in a uh, whole it also includes your manufacturing your extraction purification and packaging of all the medicines the other thing which also part uh, you know forms a part of healthcare universe is your medical equipment and supplies so all your uh, equipments like your pet ct scanners your linax uh, and your uh, you know oral uh, implantations all these comes under the medical equipment supplies then you have another uh, uh, field which is medical insurance now insurance is again split into multiple parts you have private insurance you have uh, you know you have uh, public insurance so medical insurance comprises of both then you have a telemedicine now telemedicine um, is something like where uh, you have a remote access to certain parts of the place where you know medical care cannot reach easily so you provide medical care through uh, the online methodology so briefly comprising we have this as a healthcare universe 
Now, healthcare as a market is closely, you know, is going to reach close to about $610 billion in 2026. A lot of efforts have been done by the government to improve the healthcare industry. It is going to be an evergreen industry. Uh, let's try and understand as to why it is, what are the key growth drivers, where is the demand coming from, and uh, what is the trend currently which is going on. See, um, if you actually look at, uh, apart from your IT sector, apart from the defense and other things, healthcare also forms one of the largest sectors in terms of the revenue and employment. Uh, close to about 28 million lakhs, uh, I'm sorry, 28 million jobs have been created every year. Uh, the healthcare as a sector has grown close to about 22% uh, CAGR. Now, the other thing is the telemedicine market in India is really catching up and uh, it's likely to reach about $10.6 billion by uh, 2025. Uh, if you actually look at uh, the reason is because there is a rise of per capita healthcare expenditure in India. People are becoming more and more aware and they, they are consciously trying to spend a little more on the healthcare. Government also has recently approved close to about 64,000 crores to open new, uh, you know, artificial intelligence institutes, pre uh, precision medicine. Now, uh, there was a 2.6% GDP spend last year. Now, the current budget, they are planning to probably increase it, but the baseline is around close to about 2.5% of the GDP by 25, 2025. Uh, if you actually look at the number of doctors, th this is only the allopathic doctors I'm talking about. There's hardly close to about just 13 lakh uh, uh, registered doctors again in India, which means to say for every, uh, you know, for every uh, crore, we hardly have about uh, 20 to 30 doctors, which is, uh, you know, where there is a huge headroom to grow. Number of the allopathic medical colleges are hardly 757. Now, in a country like India, where medical is really, uh, you know, gaining momentum, we need more colleges. So healthcare as a spectrum, if you see, uh, you know, it's got a great uh, scope for growth. Now, uh, if we actually see, you know, what are the key growth drivers? Why does one need to look at uh, investing here? We will try and understand that. See, there is a lot of, uh, now first I'll come to the growing demand. Now, India is actually, uh, you know, known for its medical tourism. The key markets for medical tourism is, uh, you know, primarily Delhi, Chennai, followed by Bangalore. Why? Because the cost of Indian medical, uh, uh, the, the cost of getting treatment in India is at least about 30 to 40 percent cheaper as compared to U.S. Let me just give you one or two examples. Uh, if you actually go for a, you know, a cardiac, uh, you know, for, for an angioplasty kind of a thing or a bypass, surg a bypass surgery will cost you around one crore in U.S. market. The same thing will cost you close to about 20 lakhs in a very good hospital in, in, in one of the topmost hospitals in India. So that is why a lot of people are looking at, uh, you know, getting the best healthcare at an affordable pricing. That's one thing. Mostly all, all the Middle East, uh, people, Middle East, Afghanistan, North, Central America. These are the guys who come and mostly also uh, people from Bangladesh. The rising income and affordability, if you actually see the middle class also has a, you know, the middle class per capita income also steadily driven. People are getting more conscious. So they're not, uh, you know, they're not kind of neglecting their health. They're trying to at least go and get medical attention as and when it's required. Now, India is again uh, having the elderly population because, you know, at least 30 to 35 percent of Indian population is going towards, you know, something like uh, going to be towards ja Japan kind of a thing, wherein you have elderly population ranging from 65 years to uh, 90 years. So obviously the medical care requires more traction there. Now, there are a lot of change of disease, pat uh, disease patterns here. Like earlier, you know, we used to uh, go to hospitals only for mainly surgeries and all. But these days, lifestyle disease have increased. Uh, you can see diabetes. You can see a lot of, you know, cardiac issues coming up. So all these things are, you know, uh, helping you grow the demand in the healthcare industry. Also, there are alternative uh, forms of medical uh, uh, treatments like, you know, your uh, Ayurveda and uh, homeopathic, you know, people are probably gaining uh, in more information on that and gaining traction. The other thing is the policy support. Now, if you actually see um, in India, if you want to open a greenfield hospital, there is a 100% FDI uh, waiver. This is through the automatic route. 
Um, recently, there was a reduction in the customs duty on most of the life-saving equipments as well. Also, government has done a lot to, uh, you know, probably help the medical industry in terms of the taxes. If you actually look at a uh, lot of medical equipments are uh, tax-free. Some of them, you know, like for, for example, critical health equipment, like your, you know, heart transplantation equipments are tax-free. Uh, then you, if you want to come into the public-private sector partnership, collaborative research is again aimed at, you know, specific medical colleges. Recently, you know, IIT uh, Bombay tied up with Tata Memorial Research. They came up with one of the best, uh, uh, you know, research in, in the CART therapy, which we will come back to it a little later. The government also provides a lot of financial grants, tax breaks and subsidies to encourage your uh, research and development in the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, in India, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, FDI and private sector investment is happening. The other thing is a lot of medical equipment companies are setting base uh, in India. See, one such uh, company is your Medtronic, which is a uh, island based, recently planned to invest $350 million to develop a, a Medtronic Engineering Innovation Center in Hyderabad. There is an Omron Healthcare, I'm sure most of you have heard all your BP machines uh, and all your uh, whatever, uh, you know, thermometers comes from Omron, which is widely used in the Indian market. They are, they are also setting up manufacturing plant in Tamil Nadu. Then you have Siemens, which is again planning to invest around $197 million in, uh, by 2025, again in Bangalore area. So there is a lot of, uh, you know, private equity happening, FDI happening, and a lot of research and distribution tie-ups happening in the Indian market. Uh, also, the government has, uh, you know, had a single window clearance for most of the policy-based issues. So that's another thing which is, you know, spearing the growth here. Now, uh, let's see why, what are the key demand drivers and what are the trends that we can uh, look into. Now, medical tourism, as I earlier said, there are close to about 20 lakh medical tourists who are actually coming to India to get best of, best of the healthcare. Um, so out of this, mostly at least uh, 30 to 40 percent forms cardiology, then your cancer care treatments, then comes your neurology uh, and then your, uh, uh, you know, uh, transplantation. So this is where and also the margins for medical tourism is quite high. If you actually look at uh, any hospital, the revenues coming in from international pa uh, patients will be 20 to 25 percent more than the revenue what you can get from the, uh, the Indian counterpart. So as a result, government is also quite encouraging. Uh, private players are also quite encouraging. They also look at medical tourism as one of the key revenue drivers. Then coming back to re-emergence of traditional healthcare. See, you have a lot of uh, Ayush clinics being opened up. Manipal recently tied up with one of the centers to open a, uh, you know, traditional healthcare unit kind of a thing. There are a lot of policy supports, as I earlier mentioned, which is happening again um, in India. Now, these policy supports will, uh, this policy support will again further aid the demand for healthcare investment. Now, Pradhan Mantri uh, Jan Ayog Yojana recently, you know, uh, you know, kept close to about 90,564, if I'm not wrong, uh, crores for the Pradhan Mantri uh, Ayog Yojana. Now, what is this? This is a 60% central government and 40% state government initiative where people who are at the below poverty line, a family of four, uh, two adults and, you know, two adults and two uh, children are covered completely free of uh, care. Now, in spite of government uh, doing all these things, in spite of government taking all these measures, there is still a lot of lacuna in the healthcare sector. Because what happens, either the below poverty sector is able to get medical care or, uh, you know, the, the people, most of these healthcare, uh, healthcare or the best of the centers are situated in the tier one cities. So as a result, the key population like in the tier two, tier three cities are, you know, left out with a lot of medical care. So that's another area one could look at. There are a lot of credit incentives for healthcare infra as well, which the government has uh, recently initiated. Now, one such thing is, if you, if you actually look at, um, recently $500 billion, uh, Indian government is planning to introduce a credit incentive program close to about 500 billion, uh, 500 billion rupees, which is close to $6.8 billion. This is to improve the Indian healthcare infrastructure. And obviously, there's a lot of incentives for medical travel and the telemedicine sector. So these are the key demands which, uh, which are actually fueling the growth of healthcare industry in India.
Now coming back to trends, like, okay, this is the demand. This is where there is a, a room for growth. Now, what are the trends? So as I earlier mentioned, one is, you know, uh, there are a lot of lifestyle disease, obesity, diabetes, and, you know, a lot of stress-induced disease. Then emergence of telemedicine. A lot of hospitals today are moving to telemedicine because A, that's quite cost-effective. Also, they are able to reach larger, larger patient pool, et cetera. Then you have medical equipment and supplies. Government also has largely helped the medical equipment and supplies companies to probably come set up base here in India. So as a result, that part of it is also gaining traction. You have point of care treatment. A lot of these social workers go to uh, remote areas uh, and then, you know, treat and private companies are tying up with such uh, social workers to enable care for the tier one, tier two cities. As a result, the healthcare penetration in India is, uh, is gaining traction. Technical initiatives. Now, if you actually see, there is a huge, uh, um, there, there, there is a huge, uh, what do you say? Um, what word do I use? Yeah, there's a huge improvement in technical initiatives. Like IIT Kanpur recently tied up with uh, one of the healthcare companies to, uh, you know, do research on the, the artificial heart transplantations. Then there is a new therapy which is coming, which is a form of immunotherapy, which is going to completely change the healthcare sector. Then there are a lot of uh, small, small inventions which are coming up in the medical equipment sectors. So as a result, these are the trends which are again driving the growth for the healthcare sector. Now, uh, coming back, to, you know, one such company which is there where it has poured to the healthcare sector and which is addressing, which is taking advantage of all these things and, you know, uh, pouring into the healthcare sector in a wonderful manner. Uh, the man behind this is known as the Henry Ford of heart surgery. People call him the bypass wale baba. He is one man with a mission and the method. Now, let us understand who is this and what is he proposing to do. Any guesses? Anybody wants to guess? Naresh Trehan? Maybe Shetty, I think. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, you nailed it. Yeah, yeah, you nailed it. Thank you so much for making my uh, presentation a little easier. Yes, we are talking about Narayan Hridayalaya. Uh, the founder is nobody but uh, Dr. Devi Shetty. And the hospital was founded in 2000. Uh, he does not need much of an uh, much of an introduction, actually. One of the very known uh, cardiologists, one of the very famous cardiologists in India and abroad. Now, he's got a lot of first to his credit. Uh, he started the uh, Narayan Hridhyalaya in the year 2000. Later on in uh, 2013, it got re-christened to Narayana Health uh, Services. Now, if you actually notice, uh, overall, as a Nar Narayana Hridayale, or Narayana Health has got close to about 5,683 uh, healthcare facilities. They have uh, they have about three heart centers. They have clinic and dialysis center close to 70. They also have one healthcare center in Cayman Islands. Now, Cayman Islands is anywhere between the U.S. and the, the British territory. So this was done, this was opened uh, in the year 2030 to provide best medical care to the citizens of Northern and Latin America. The overall revenue of the company is close to about 5,018 crores currently. The uh, Narayan Tadiala is also into hospitals, pharmacies and diagnostic centers. The best thing about this, uh, this healthcare center is they are NABL and JCR accredited. Uh, the certain key facts, they have uh, close to about 4,224 doctors on panel. They have 100 plus clinical speciality and subspeciality, 6,074 capacity of beds. Now, uh, we need to understand a little bit of operational metrics when it comes to uh, hospital industry. A hospital industry, what do you actually measure? What do you actually look? What you measure is number of the total beds a hospital can probably have and also the number of operational beds a hospital can probably have. Operational beds is where it also in, in, induces variable costs, like your doctors, your support staff, and your admin staff, etc. Then the other thing is your inpatient and your outpatient revenue. Like inpatient are the people who actually come in for surgeries, outpatient is the, pe uh, the people who come in for the daily. Then you have an average length of stay, how long the inpatient is going to stay in the hospital. Okay. Now, the other, uh, you know, measurement metrics is also known as ARPA, which is average revenue per operating bed. For example, in a hospital, if a person is staying close to about uh, XYZ, X number of days, 
and the, the hospital has got close to about 50 to 60 percent occupancy what is my revenue so these are some of the metrics on which a particular hospital is measured upon so when you compare competition or when you compare various hospitals these are the aspects that we take into account now uh, coming back to uh number of uh, hospitals now looking at uh, they have uh, they have presence in south north west east uh, india as i earlier mentioned they also have presence in cayman islands now uh, except for narayana institute of cardiac sciences which is a flagship hospital in bangalore and uh, rabindranath tagore cardiac sciences which is in Cal calcutta the rest of both of these were pre-2007 both of these are greenfield uh, projects that most of the other hospitals are either tie up through an NGO or tie up through a private entity and a revenue sharing uh, model, etc. Now, let's uh, fairly understand who the people are. Now, uh, whenever you look at any particular industry, you always look at who are the people behind it. Because, you know, like how you say, tell me who your friends are, I'll tell you who you are. You also tell, uh, you also say, tell me who the management is, I'll tell you who the, uh, how the organization is. So, uh, uh, Dr. Devi Shetty, you don't need any introduction. He's a Padma Bhushan awardee again. Uh, one thing, he had a mission. He had a mission of affordable health care to a lot of people. So anybody who walks into the hospital will not go untreated. This has been his uh, mission all through the while. Any of the hospitals you can visit, if you cannot afford, you will still be treated and given best medical care. Uh, Viren Prashad Shetty, again, an executive vice chairman. He's a Stanford graduate. Emmanuel, Dr. Emmanuel Rupert, again, one of the best uh, uh, you know, cardiologists and the, the doc, group CEO. Uh, you have Anish Shetty, who is a director of Cayman Islands. Then uh, Mrs. Shaw, you don't have to say, she's a founder of Biocon. Dr. Nachiket Moore, again, an IMA graduate who was in the panel of Bill Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Mr. Shankar Arnachalam, an expert CA at, uh, you know, management. So if you actually look at the overall management uh, uh, tenure, it's about 5.4 years, which is quite a lot. I'm talking about the average management tenure. Uh, then you have Dr. Devi Shetty is close to for about 24 years uh, and Dr. Emmanuel Rupert who's got about 5.4 years. Average, uh, you know, ex uh, hours, I mean, average uh, number of ex expertise put in. Now, let us understand uh, the SWOT of Narayana Radhyalaya. What are his strengths, weakness, threats and opportunities? Now, as I earlier mentioned, they've got an extensive network. Uh, they are present in Northwest, East uh, and South India. They have specialized services like they have, they are primary, they were primarily known for cardiology. They, was, they are slowly moving into, uh, you know, oncology and, you know, other form of medical fields. They have advanced medical technologies. If you actually see, they are number one in certain medical technologies, which I will come to it a little later. Uh, they also have this enhancing patient care and clinical. Narayana Hridhyalaya, if you actually notice, is consistently on the innovation path in technology. When you compare all the other hospitals to Narayana, one key thing you notice is you will be very surprised to know a lot of software engineers have been recruited in hospital. The reason is because they make use of the cutting edge technology to ensure the efficiency. Then they also have a reputation for affordable health care. Uh, currently, he can, I mean, obviously, this is being said by the management, they can claim that nobody else is doing something like what they are doing, that they are, they have a reputation for affordable health care. So nobody goes untreated. Um, now, if you actually look at the opportunities, obviously, uh, you know, the way the healthcare market is growing, they can expand into new markets. Uh, they can always also look into growth in the medical tourism, they can tap those markets as well. A lot of digital in initiatives in health, like uh, they have recently opened up a lot of clinics, you know, smaller clinics. They've had a tie up with them where they can also administer a lot of outpatient initiatives wherein people come. There is a quick turnaround. They also get affordable health care. Partnerships and collaborations, uh, like they've recently, uh, you know, tied up with IIT Kanpur to, uh, to develop and uh, to understand the artificial health transplantation, if that could be manufactured in India. That is uh, one of their flagship projects. Again, focus on preventive healthcare. 
they are also coming up with a lot of measures to uh, address this market where there's a huge opportunity for preventive healthcare. One being, uh, they recently launched their insurance. Uh, Aditi, the insurance uh, was launched, Narayana uh, Health Insurance Limited. They formed a subsidiary. Aditi was launched. Now, what this does is it gives you one crore worth of uh, coverage for surgeries and also five lakh worth of, uh, you know, other medical related issues for a family of four. And the premium is just about 10,000 rupees. Uh, we'll talk about it a little later when we come to as to what they're doing. Now, coming back to their weaknesses. Now, what they're currently doing is they have high dependency on key specialities. Obviously, they need to penetrate a little more to drive volumes because just you know, looking at, uh, you know, uh, key specialities will not give them the required revenue. There is also a key man risk because the entire brand was built on Dr. Na uh, Dr. Devi Shetty. So now slowly they, they are addressing this thing of, uh, they're addressing this issue of moving away from Dr. Uh, Devi Shetty to establishing the other uh, expertise as well. Uh, one unique thing about Narayana is they are having something known as a cluster expertise. What they do is, they are, they are USPs, they form a particular cluster. For example, in South India, the Bangalore, uh, Bangalore has got their flagship hospital. They form cluster around that. You have uh, Mumbai, I'm sorry, you have Shivmoga, you have Mysore. So any tertiary care which is required, they kind of send them to the Bangalore hospitals. So, and they've created uh, expertise, like for example, the, the flagship hospital is known for cardiology. And then if you look at their uh, Kiran Majum Darsha hospital, it's known for oncology. They're doing cutting edge therapy. Then if you look at, uh, you know, one of the hospitals in Gurgaon, they are doing, again, uh, you know, cutting edge work in oncology. So they are, you know, slowly moving away from looking at, you know, depending on one person for the brand reputation to having very good doctors in the panel of specialists uh, who will probably dilute the key man risk. Now, if you actually notice, I said extensive network, but here I'm also saying geographic concentration. They have extensive network, but in only in key geographies. So their presence is mainly in, you know, like, uh, you know, southern India, like in Bangalore, then there in Calcutta, in East India, there's a Calcutta kind of a thing. They need to kind of uh, move a little more because what is happening is if you look at, you know, uh, whatever you uh, really uh, primary or the primitive, uh, not primary, if you look at the healthcare aspect, the quality healthcare, most of the good hospitals are situated in Delhi. Then comes Chennai, then comes Bangalore. But there are a lot of tier one, tier two cities who are left out in terms of good medical care. So that is where they need to kind of look into it. The geographical concentration might, might also have a, uh, impact on their uh, revenue. Uh, again, this come up here, it's a capital intensive business. Now, for example, to set up a particular hospital, uh, I'm just giving a brief idea. It closely takes about three to four years to commission a particular hospital. Then it takes another three to four years to become EBITDA positive. So roughly about eight years for a hospital to completely uh, be profitable. And it's a capital intensive business. Unless you have deep pockets, it becomes a little difficult. So uh, that's another uh, weakness there a lot of uh, you know key uh, threats what we can say is you know a lot of government uh, uh, initiatives like you know for example healthcare pricing controls if there is a certain cap on the medicines you have a problem then there is an intense competition you know like three people are you know cutting revenues people are providing the same amount of care but trying to cut uh, uh, you know trying to cut the prices so this is where you have, and you still need to keep up the margins at the same time, provide quality care. Obviously, that's one part one needs to address. There's a lot of technological disruption, as you uh, know, like, you know, how COVID played around with us. Uh, we were not prepared. And later on, you know, there is a whole gamut of healthcare emphasis, which came across. Again, public health crisis is COVID-19, which we have mentioned. For example, there's another thing. Uh, recently, there was a Supreme Court uh, judge who mentioned, like, in case if you're not under the Clinical Establishment Act, what happens is everything should come under a CGHSA system. Now, what this means is that if you, if I am a poor person or I'm rich, I get to pay the same, uh, you know, amount of money for my medical expenses. Now, that's not affordable. That cannot be viable. So, these are some of the aspects one needs to look at or the company as a whole needs to look at.
Now, coming back to key competition. Now, actually, uh, Narayana Vidyalaya is a small cap, a small cap company, whereas a Fortis and Apollo Hospitals are a large cap company. Now, the reason I've mentioned them is they also started off as a single uh, speciality and later on they, uh, look in, they looked into the multiple diversified hospitals. If you look at Fortis, they've got 4,500 beds. They've got a great uh, uh, legacy and uh, they are one of the premium care service providers in India. But what happened is they are currently, uh, I'm sure most of you know the, the dietary and the story behind this. Uh, so right now they are entangled in certain legal issues. Though they are able to generate good revenues, uh, the legal entanglement will again have, a, uh, we, will have some kind of impact on the fortis. The second thing is Apollo. Apollo, as you all know, uh, was started by Dr. Reddy. Now, uh, fantastically started in Chennai. Now they've got presence. Uh, they've got uh, close to about 10,000 beds. Again, they are premiumly priced. They have broad network of hospitals in India. Uh, they have high pro profitability due to premium service offerings. But again, if you notice, Apollo 24 bar 7 is a cash burning venture. They have, uh, you know, digital setup, Apollo 24 bar 7. Uh, for a 1,000 crore revenue, there's a five to 600 crore, uh, you know, cash burn. Uh, also, there is a succession planning. They've, he's got four daughters. So each of the daughters is looking at various aspects of the hospital division. So again, since they have multiple grandchildren going forward, what is the succession plan? We don't know. So that's another uh, part of it. The third thing is Max Healthcare. Now, uh, Abhay Soy, one of the known as a turnaround man, uh, as you rightly say. And uh, he was the one who took up, Nara, uh, who took up uh, Max Healthcare. And he has grown the revenues really. It is, in fact, Max Healthcare has got one of the highest ARPOGs if you actually look at compared to all the other hospitals. But again, one key thing is it's got a very limited presence in tier two cities. Now, one interesting thing about Max was like when nobody else was doing COVID treatments, Max stepped in in 2021 uh, and they started treating COVID patients in their uh, uh, Mumbai hospital. That's Nanavati, you know, doc, uh, uh, Mr. Amita Bachchan was treated in the hospital. That's where they got a lot of traction. Again, they're positioned as a very premium service provider. Now, where does Narayana fall here? Primarily, Narayana, uh, can, we, we can consider them as an affordable healthcare to underserved regions. Okay. If you notice, most of these hospitals, it is not affordable for a simple, uh, you know, for people from tier one and tier two cities to get the required healthcare. So as a result, uh, you know, Narayana occupies this space and how are they able to generate revenues, keeping the cost under uh, consideration, is the, their, which is why they have cost leadership. Now, I've just given you broad-based uh, numbers. Again, this is taken from Screener. If you actually look at Narayana, uh, you know, it's got a 25,000, uh, 387 crores market cap, 5,018 crores of revenue. Their sales have been growing close to about 10% year on year. Uh, they have a, a decent profit growth of 31%. Their ROI return on assets is close to about 16%. If you actually see, they have a very good, uh, you know, debt equity ratio of 0.56, roughly 0.6. Krishna Institute of Medical Science is another competitor again, which is obviously, you know, uh, there in Hyderabad. They also have a very unique, uh, uh, you know, uh, very unique methodology. They follow this hub and spoke model, wherein they create a hub in and around uh, in Hyderabad, and they create spokes across various cities in Hyderabad, so they can get good uh, care. Kim's uh, uh, Kim's is also doing really well, but again, uh, penetration to various other cities is, is a cause of concern. So roughly, this is the overall uh, comparative analysis as to where Narayana stands vis-a-vis -vis the other people. So a lot of players, what they're doing is either they're doing a merger and acquisition or they're doing a co-development or they're doing a differentiation where Narayana occupies its space is cost leadership. First thing, cutting edge technology, as I'd mentioned in the previous slide and high quality healthcare. It is also accessible to broad people. Now, we will also see how they are able to do it in what way. Now, as an investor, what we actually see, okay, fine, all this is fine. So where do I, where do I get the revenue? Where do I uh, show me the money? 
uh, their revenues, the consolidated operating revenues for the last year was around 50,183 million. They have a consolidated EBITDA of about uh, 1,275 uh, million, again, which is a very good uh, EBITDA margin growth of 24.5. They have a part of 7,896 million again. Now, if you actually notice, now coming back to this uh, slide, now they are number one in certain aspects. They're doing cutting edge technologies. For example, they have, uh, you know, one of their institutes, that is Narana Institute of Cardiac Sciences, they performed TAVI, that is Trans Aortal Valve Interceptor. Now, what happens is, I'll just briefly tell you not to get into too technical thing. When your aortas, which uh, produces, which uh, supplies the blood flow to the rest of the body, when there there is a block and somebody cannot uh, do the, you know, uh, can cannot going for an open heart surgery, this procedure is a cutting edge technology which is being performed. So that will give a new life to the patient. That is one thing. Their Kiran Mazumdar Shah Center uh, did something known as a CART therapy. Now CART therapy is a chimer antigen receptor. What happens is certain amount of blood cancer which you have is not curable. So what they do is they draw the blood from your body and then uh, they uh, remove the white blood cells from your body. They inject this, uh, they, they genetically engineered DNA is injected and then you reinfuse the blood to the patient's body. So what happens is this is a form of immunotherapy. Now the cost of this immunotherapy is close to about four to five crores abroad. Whereas in India, you can get it close to 20 lakhs. And one of the, uh, you know, after, uh, one of the pioneers who have done this is, again, Narayana Health in Bangalore. Obviously, there was one which was done in Hinduja, Mumbai. So, uh, the, the point I'm trying to emphasize is, not only they are affordable, but they are also focusing on cutting edge technology as well. Uh, this is just briefly the snapshot, again, taken from their investment view. They have a total borrowing of 14,437. Now, if you actually look at borrowing, it, it might feel a little lot, but if you actually look at their current investments in cash and bank balance, they are well, uh, you know, well uh, spared ahead. They have a just net debt of 1837 million. That is close, uh, 1837 million. That is approximately about, uh, if you see, uh, you know, uh, 0.6 of debt equity ratio, which is quite healthy for any organization. Now, this is where we have just projected. So usually you give a CAGR for three years. Now, uh, you know, March 21 being an outlier due to COVID and all, we've like, tried to project it for the CAGR of four years. If you see revenue from operations, have had a healthy growth. Operating profit is at about 28% growth. I'm talking about CAGR, not year-on-year -year basis. You have a profit before tax of 53% and net profit of 61%. This is again CAGR growth. And their revenue for last three years, I mean, again, CAGR was close to 25%, which is quite healthy. On an average, a healthcare industry CAGR is considered somewhere around 20 to 21% overall. Now, uh, one thing we need to understand here is uh, that, you know, where, does it, where do they drive the revenues from? And what is a payer mix? Now, payer mix is something like, who are the people who are paying me for my hospital? Uh, if you actually, uh, I will not get into Q4 because that's all there for you uh, uh, to have a look at it. I'll just give you a bro overall picture. Now, 35% of their revenue comes from cardiac sciences and uh, you have various other, uh, you have 16% coming in from another department. You have 4% coming in from oncology, you have renal sciences. Okay. So specialty profile, if you actually say most of the revenue is derived from cardiac and oncology. Then if you look at cluster wise, which of my cluster is giving me great revenues? If you look at the uh, ba uh, Bangalore, then followed by Calcutta, then followed by the other southern peripherals. If you look at who is paying me my revenue, if you actually look at your domestic walk-in patients, a quiet head, they form 44% of your average revenue. Then you have insured patients. Then you have insured patients, which is close to 28%. Now insurance is again private and uh, uh, you know public insurance. Then you have uh, the other schemes as well, which is the, the, the private schemes like your managed care, which comes in. Then you have international patients. 
So th this is roughly the payout profile. So the concentration is more towards South India uh, and uh, uh, South India in terms of the cluster wise, specialty wise, uh, now, now they rated number one cardiacs, followed by oncology and followed by the other specialties. The pro payer profile is also, you know, first is walk-in patients, then, uh, you know, the insured patients and scheme followed by international patients. Uh, as I earlier mentioned, uh, what we actually look at when you measure a hospital is how much of revenue they are generating inpatient and outpatient. Uh, for the last Q4, they've had highest revenues both in India as well as in uh, Cayman Islands. If you uh, roughly say it, it is close to about in Cayman, it is about 123, uh, 123,000 or 123,000 rupees in Indian revenue. This is for uh, India. The average length of stay is also reducing. See what happens is uh, the more the patient stays. Now, if you if you have an efficient healthcare system, you discharge patients very soon. So as a result, you improve your revenue. So if you actually see from FI23 to FI24, their average length of stay is also decreased. The patient footfall has increased uh, from 2363 to 2541. Again, the ICI occupied uh, bed days also quite healthy. The ARPO, if you actually look, uh, look at for uh, the, this year, was around 14.9 million as against 13.5 in the last quarter. Uh, year on year also, there's a healthy ARPO growth. Uh, 14 million uh, in 24 and 12.7 million in FI 23. Now, uh, where does the money go? Okay, fine. That is a revenue. Now, where am I spending a lot of my money? Now, uh, one thing we need to know again, uh, here it plays a very important role. If, uh, if hospital is having its own land, then you don't have to worry about the, uh, the uh, you know, lease and rentals and, you know, because most of the times what happens is six to seven percent of your revenue goes off in your leased lands. Like, for example, HCG, which has got a cancer center in Bangalore. Now, that is a that is a rented place. So if it's rented, then a lot of your revenues moves into rentals, which will have an impact on the margins. So here what happens is, uh, so Narayana is in, in a very good place. Your uh, doctors and nurses, uh, you know, the, in the cost structure, it forms about 28%. The other expenses uh, forms about 24.2. Uh, your consumable expenses, again, sorry, consumable will be around 24.2. And uh, the rest of the other manpower cost, like your support staff, is about 11.8. Now, one thing that we can actually notice here is there is a huge inflation. There is close to about 5 to 6% inflation cost year on year. But still... Narayana has uh, been able to manage this inflation without passing the cost on to its uh, uh, to its patients. The reason is the cutting edge technology, which I will come to it a little later as to how they they managed to do this. So if you if you notice from uh, FI twenty three to twenty four, there's not much of an increase in terms of consumable expenses. In fact, it is reduced from twenty four point six to twenty four point two. When there is an inflation, how can you reduce the cost? It is where you, uh, you know, have the process efficiency. So this is where the God is in details. They have dissected every part of their operation to small chunks and they're focusing on each of the chunks to make it better. Again, this is the uh, uh, Cayman revenue. Now, Cayman Islands forms 30% of your EBITDA and 20% of your revenue overall roughly. And they were also had a healthy uh, growth as well. No, it was uh, it was close to about uh, one twenty three point nine million uh, this year actually. Huh, one twenty three point nine million this year. That's roughly about thousand thirty seven crores, and uh, that's grown from around nine hundred and fourteen crores last year. If you actually look at your outpatient revenue, outpatient revenue also has uh, grown close to about two fifty four crores. That's uh, yeah two fifty four crores roughly from twenty. Uh, 249 crores. So there is a healthy growth there as well. Uh, they have recently bought an ENT center in Cayman Islands. There is also another uh, Kama hospital which is coming up, which is an oncology based hospital, which is the uh, expansion uh, which is happening. Now, if you look at where the revenue is coming from, the South India, the Bangalore forms 38% of their revenue followed by Calcutta, which is close to 26%, and followed by North, uh, the other part of North India, which, uh, which is close to 14%. Uh, 
Um, if you actually notice this, if you will see a year on year revenue growth has been the highest in the Eastern peripheral where they have had a strong brand recognition. Again, hospital, now uh, some key aspects, some of their hospitals were EBITDA negative. Slowly this year, they're becoming EBITDA positive because as you know, the gestation period in hospitals are quite high. Their Gurugram uh, hospital has recently become EBITDA positive and slowly they're looking at, uh, you know, generating double digit revenues. And also the ad pop figures are here for you. Now, just a, a you know fair idea of who are the key. Uh, now, uh, uh, Dr. Shetty holds close to the management holds close to about sixty three percent of uh, the uh, the market share promoter group, and uh, the rest of the key DIs and FIS are just there for you to you know kind of quickly go through. You have Vanguard, you have Kuwait Investment, you have Franklin Templeton, you have Simca Partners. These are the investors in the, in in the company. No, all this is fine. Now, this is the past history. Now, where is the revenue coming in from? How am I going to grow? See, in year 2023 and 24, they had made huge CapEx infusion. Now, this CapEx infusion was primarily to, uh, to, to grow the India business. They have uh, they have had a four-pronged strategy to growth. One is A, CapEx infusion. The other, the other one is completely digital transformation, which I will come to it. Then you have a supply chain strengthening and then you have an ESG vision. So roughly, uh, last time it's close to about, uh, you know, 23 and 24 have been roughly about uh, 1,000 crores. And now they, they have another 1,045 crores, uh, you know, earmarked for expansion. Now out of this 1,045 crores, it is uh, just about 270 crores will be for Cayman. The rest of it will be the India operations. Now from whatever we could gather from the management, uh, you know, call or the management discussion, uh, they, we are not able to translate this to number of beds which would come in future. The reason is this uh, amount is being earmarked to, uh, you know, decongest the existing bottlenecks. Because what happens is they are current, they have a 60% uh, operating capacity, they are 60% occupancy right now, but their ICUs or the rooms are completely, uh, you know, they, they have a huge bottlenecks in terms of the OTs and ICUs. So this is where a lot of uh, your investments are going on to ensure that they upgrade all this and, uh, you know, and they, and they make a the hospital a better revenue management system. Uh, they've recently bought a Linux system in Shimoga and they're also upgrading all their machineries. That's another way. Uh, where the money is going to go in future, they have bought uh, they have bought land in Calcutta, uh, you know, close to 180 crores. It's about 3 lakh square feet. The current land uh, which they have, they are again expanding, adding another three lakh square feet, uh, adding another three lakh square feet in the existing capacity. Also, they are expanding in Delhi as well. So primarily, all the capex infusion is going to happen. Uh, we, the previous capex infusion has happened for all the uh, of existing facilities. Going forward, the capex infusion will happen for uh, uh, for greenfield expansions. Now, in terms of the digital transformation, what they are going to do is, um, see, uh, they've, as I earlier mentioned, they have dissected everything. Uh, they've recently come up with an insurance arm. Now, this insurance arm is for managed health care. The managed health care, where they are, they are penetrating tier one, tier two cities, which is like, obviously, you know, the, 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 it's a revenue generation. But you might say, okay, fine, you know, there, there are a lot of managed healthcare companies in the US which are following similar model. But the beauty of this is they have started a pilot project, uh, which is currently in Bangalore and Mysore. There also, there is a small uh, caveat emptor, wherein, you know, they have the, the red ring, green ring, and the thing. So if you don't have any health issues, you get into a green ring. If you have health issues, you get into the red ring. They uh, kind of manage it for some amount of time, and then they see whether you're eligible for the policy. They, of course, give you a policy, but you will have to adhere to their strict rules and regulations. See, this is one of their initiatives to help penetrate tier one, tier two cities at the later stages, provide affordable healthcare, and also to ensure, uh, you know, they are pouring into preventive healthcare management. Then they've recently uh, tied up with Summit, which is their internal supply chain management arm. So uh, they are into distribution of pharmaceuticals, medical equipment, et cetera, which is also for their captive capacity. 
uh, they've also tied up with uh, uh, with another technology company, Atma, wherein uh, what they do is this is the uh, analysis, technical analysis which you uh, perform. Uh, the cutting edge thing is, if you, for example, go with an ECG report, they are able to predict whether are you a patient for further surgical procedures or not, or whether if you perform a further surgical procedures, what are the key uh, recovery rates. So there are some cutting edge inventions which are being done there. Then you have Adi. Again, see, Adi is a, has got a very interesting story there. Um, because most of the people, when they used to come to the hospital, they used to notice that, you know, a lot of time is gone in documentation. So they've got an app uh, online, which is uh, which is digitized most of the things. So right from the time and time you walk in to the time you come out, everything is digitized. So it will save a lot of manpower, again, cutting costs there. Again, uh, if you notice, a lot of nurses, usually what they do is they do a lot of documentation process. Again, here, uh, there is a nursing app, which is launched called Namaha. Close to about 5,000 person hours have been saved. So each of the functions in, in, in the management have been broken into clusters and pieces. And then each of those have been addressed for operational efficiency. Uh, again, they have a lot of ESG. Now, as you know, there is a lot of demand for doctors. They have been training a lot of doctors in-house in the cutting edge technology. Um, so, you know, later on when time comes, they can provide, uh, they can appoint them in uh, their respective hospitals. They have a renewable uh, energy mix. Uh, they have, you know, they have committed to uh, do the renewable energy mix. Now here, there is a very interesting aspect. The waste management, most of the hospitals, there is an issue, but they are going for the ozone waste management, which is again quite cost effective. Again, they are coming up with certain uh, initiatives like you know paperless, uh, uh, paperless hospitalization kind of a thing. Uh, they are also industry leaders in the clinical governance plan. Now, clinical governance plan is one of the key aspects which is taking a lot of cognizance here in India. So that is where they want to be the industry leaders as well. Most of their hospitals, uh, they want them to be accredited by NABH and GSEI certified. Now, this certification obviously will ensure that they have the required quality for the, uh, the health care. Uh, research is another important uh, today if they are able to be there where they are is only because of the fact that they have been doing a lot of research publications uh, you know focusing a lot of cutting edge technologies they have close to about uh, more than 1000 publication publications in which their peer reviews have been done they have a great risk management process in place and they are also looking at a zero trust architecture by 2025 so these are some of the initiatives which they have uh, used to ensure that, you know, they are able to uh, A, cut costs, generate revenues, increase volumes by uh, outpatient penetration and reduce the inpatient stay. So they are addressing all aspects of healthcare. Now, if you look at, okay, uh, before coming into technical, uh, the, the key takeaway is uh, what we are looking, so the next one or two years, Whatever they have done is not uh, because, you know, as I earlier mentioned that the expansion is going to take time. So all the offer, the uh, all the hospitals uh, will come into fruition by around 2026 to 2028. So right now, this is a work in progress phase for them. Having said that, uh, they are also, you know, process efficiency is where they are looking at. And uh, they are looking at increased inpatient volumes through their smaller affordable clinics. Uh, coming back to technicals, th this is about uh, three, four days ago. So what, uh, it's, it's about 12.50. Obviously, the you know EMAs and the SMAs is also looking good. And uh, now, again, this is not a recommendation for buy or sell. Uh, but one can actually delve a little deeper to understand, you know, whether, you know, this is going to be a good dog. Uh, hospital to look into or this is going to be a good place to put your money in. Again, please understand one thing. You need to know your why. Uh, for me, if you ask me personally, I like the man, I like the ethos because I don't think any other hospital apart from certain amount of charity are looking at affordable healthcare yet being smart enough to generate the revenues which are required to scale up their operations and be profitable. So that is where I uh, kind of, uh, you know, I kind of pledge my bet on um, 
having said that, obviously, as I mentioned, you need to know why you would want to do that. Thank you. And thank you for your time. And I'm ready to take questions. Thank you, Shitalji, for a very good presentation. It gives a very comprehensive insight, actually. So I know this company, but <laughs> the way you presented it is very good. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, any questions for her? Um, Hi, uh, Mahesh here. Yeah, good. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Mahesh. Yeah. Thank you, Shitali. It was a great detailed uh, presentation. As you might be knowing, there was a uh, recent uh, ruling from Supreme Court with regard to the affordable affordable health care. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what's your take on that? I wanted to understand your thought because since then, most of the hospital talks actually have gone sideways. There is no, I mean, at least the hospital that I'm tracking would like to understand what's your take, what's what's the outcome it's going to be. Do you think it's going to impact the, uh, you know, the hospitals, uh, especially the uh, Narayanas and uh, Rainbows and Apollos? Okay. See, uh, one is, uh, there are two things into the affordable health care. One is the government initiative, which it has already done to ensure that, you know, certain section of the society gives into the, uh, are benefited by the government uh, uh, affordable health care. The other one is private entities doing it. Now, as you know, in India, as per the IRDA rules that you have, you cannot launch any insurance company or anything without the IRDA regulation. You cannot have an affordable health care policy if you are not registered with IRDA. So as a result, the point in case is you need to have an insurance regulatory license if you need to go ahead with this. It's a lot of companies, it's very difficult for them to see. It's very few that they can afford to do. Lot many companies are not coming in. First, they have to take an insurance license and then they can provide an affordable health care, uh, which is why a lot of companies are taking backseat. The other aspect of it is, it is still under a pilot run here in India. Like if you actually notice, there's a Bangalore-based company called Even, which is doing it. Again, uh, it, it is also not, uh, not caught in great amount of traction because it will take time. Because this managed care model, what we're talking about, is very well diversified in, uh, in uh, US and Europe, European countries. I think Kaiser Diamante is doing it, another German company is doing it, if I'm not wrong, and they've had a very good response. But in India, it is at a very nascent stage. Somebody who's got a large hospital industry can afford to do this, uh, which is why Narayana has actually forayed into this sector. Having said that, it is also very new. They are not looking at re 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 generating a lot of revenue out of this, but they are looking at it from an experimental perspective and so that you know they can have greater penetration and a lot of people are aware about the healthcare. And here also, uh, if I may put across this point, there is a lot of, uh, you know, there are a lot, lot of caveats here. You need to be under the certain ring and et cetera. But yes, it's a good initiative. Somebody who is in the middle class sector, who cannot, uh, who does not come under a BPL level, but who cannot afford a, a you know, a, a quality healthcare paying premium prices, for them, it's going to be a very good aspect to look into. What it can actually do is it will create a lot of awareness for people to take healthcare a little more seriously. I mean, that's my take. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. That's helpful. Uh, just to add to, you know, a very deep dive presentation, Shikhal, that you have done, uh, because I know Dr. Devi Shetty since 96, uh, when he was in Calcutta BM Birla Hospital. So that's why he has a lot of following from East. You know, that's why when he made Narayana Hospital in Bangalore, he shifted to Bangalore. The people in Kolkata really missed him. And that's when West Bengal government, you know, gave the land to him to build that Ravinna Tagore Institute in uh, Calcutta itself. So he, at that time, also believed in patient-centric care, you know. So he used to ask rich patients, he used to charge them more so that he can do free treatment of the poor. And that's why he's loved by patients. And that's why, you know, people just throng to his hospitals, whether in Kolkata or in other places. And this new scheme also, I think, he has brought uh, because he really feels for the patient, unlike most of the other hospitals, which are totally commercial. So that's my two cents to add to.
to the value that Dr. Devi Shetty brings with him, you know, uh, well, as a promoter of across... Narayana. Yes, that's very true. Thank you for bringing across that point. In fact, you might also have this uh, thought process in mind, you know, there's a lot of headroom for India, why, you know, uh, uh, healthcare was opened in Cayman Islands. This is one of the key reasons, because uh, he has a say, I need to have a shift in an industry which is outside US, but which is able to provide healthcare, healthcare to the US people. So as you see, the Cayman Islands was chosen because it's outside the U.S. tertiary. So a lot of U.S. regulations does not apply. So uh, and it, it at the same time, it is also able to provide the uh, required quality health care to the people of U.S. and, and in the British territories. And, um, you know, just for the knowledge, because he... It, because he expressed the desire to open uh, you know medical facility in Cayman Islands, 13 laws were completely twisted to ensure that he forms the hospital there, and which I don't think anybody else globally has done for any other healthcare industry. So great respect to the man behind the whole show. Any other questions? For Hi, um, my name is Murli Sheetal. Great presentation. A really very, very detailed, very thorough. Thank you for putting so much efforts. Um, you know, in, in uh, tele-treatment today or telemedicine, it's all about having a conversation and then, uh, you know, getting the treatment or, you know, most of this could be um, disorders of life that people go through. But... Yes. Has Narayanaja invested in any kind of advanced technology that can do remote operations? Or I don't know. I'm just asking because it's a huge yeah. space and it's growing. And if they do develop, then, you know, there's a huge upside there. Yes. So uh, right now, there are certain research aspects which are going on, which is at a very nascent stage. Uh, having uh, said that, they have come up with this e ECG machine, uh, you know, efforts are on to commercialize it, but not completely from the Naran. Obviously, they'll have a tie up with somebody, it's too early to reveal the names. But they have come up with some single ECG machine, uh, they are, the research is still on, where they are able to carry to remote areas. Uh, obviously, their healthcare service providers will be able to carry it. And you can detect whether it is going, it is bound to, uh, whether this patient is bound to have heart attack in the next few uh, months or whatever the, the time period. Now, that's a great breakthrough in healthcare, A, in terms of technology. B, even though if you have a breakthrough like this, if it does not reach the people, then there is no point having the technology. So the tele the the telecommunication the telemedicine technology will enable that such uh, kind of uh, you know equipments are carried to the remote places. A lot of people are being benefited out of this. So yes, there are efforts in that area to ensure that you know this reaches a larger community. Also, telemedicine, another thing is a lot of awareness is being created. So people who are in remote area, they don't even know that, you know, something like this form of treatments could be there for them. So this will create a lot of awareness. Yes, they can also go, get a quality health care at affordable cost. Thank you. Thank you, Shital. I hope I have been able to do justice to your question. No, yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Shetal, thank you for your presentation. I think in the interest of time, we have to move to the next presentation. Thank you. And any other questions, guys, you can put in the chat and she can answer to you. Thank you, Shetal, once again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, one I'm, and all, for your time. Hi, I'm Obji. Uh, hello, hello. Yeah. So you can start sharing. I'm in Bangalore this week, so hopefully Wi Fi should not be a problem. It is much better. Okay. Uh, is my screen visible? Uh, not yet. Yes, now it is. So I'm uh, speaking on a small cap, uh, micro cap, in fact, uh, infrastructure company. It's called AVP Infracon Limited. 
briefly, I will. Uh, it has a market capital of three fifty three crores, but in the current price is around one forty one. Briefly, I will uh, go about why I chose this sector, and then we will uh, dwell upon this company and see if this is the one which will take us through to the next level. So, during the past decade, from uh, post uh, two thousand fourteen. There are some uh, huge infrastructure developments that has happened in India, and it's a multi-decadal theme. And uh, this, as per uh, government, they want to uh, make it uh, develop uh, this thing by 2047. So they want all the roads and uh, infrastructure to be present by 2037. So these are some of the highlights of the last decade. This is the Statue of Unity, World's tallest statue, and then you have the Atal Tunnel, world's longest highway tunnel. Then you have the world, world's highest railway bridge in Chinab and the Zuzilla Tunnel, which is Asia's longest tunnel. So what has happened in the last uh, 10 years uh, when it comes to road building? So 60% growth in national highway network in the last 10 years, which is uh, commendable. Uh, there, is, there has been an increase of 500% uh, budget allocation for road transport and highway leading to substantial enhancement in infrastructure development. The speed of highway construction in 2020 20 to 21 reached around 37 kilometers per day, which is the highest uh, till date. Moreover, the national highway network has expanded by 60%. When we say uh, which has expanded uh, pr prior to 2014, it was 91,000 kilometers. And uh, at the end of 2023, it was around 1,46,000 kilometers. The length of four-lane national highway has increased by 2.5 times when compared to pre-2014. So I'll just show you a brief graph. So this, the left-hand side is the graph on, from 2014, where uh, single-lane uh, roads comprised around 30% of the total road infrastructure, and two lanes was around 50, and uh, four lanes and above was about 20%. Now, if you compare to 2023 data, this uh, single lane road has reduced to 10% and the double lane plus more has increased to 58% and the four lanes has increased uh, to around 32%. That is nearly 2.5x compared to the 2014 uh, this thing. And the length of the national highway has increased by 60% as discussed previously. So what are the key flagship government schemes uh, which is driving this model? So you have the Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana, which has contributed 3.73 lakh kilometer of rural roads constructed in the past 20, 10 years, uh, with an impressive, uh, which is quite impressive. And there's still, uh, the plan is to build uh, double this figure by 2037. And you have the Bharat Mala Yojana. This is basically to increase the uh, to improve the infrastructure and uh, Im reduce the logistics. So as per this project, 25 greenfield highway speed, uh, high speed corridors have been envisaged, out of which 20 are completed or under various stages of implementation. 34,800 kilometers of national highway length was planned for development under phase one of Bharat Mala Yojana. And as of December, 2023, about 76% has been awarded for construction with completion of about nearly 40% uh, of it, uh, which is 15,500 kilometers. So what are the opportunities uh, going through the uh, next decade? So NHIA is uh, supposed to offer 450 billion worth of uh, build, operate, transfer road projects in 2024 to 25. And the plan is to offer 53 projects worth 2.2 trillion covering 5,200 kilometers under build, operate, transfer mode for the next three to five years. And uh, the recent, uh, the next week when the budget would be presented, the uh, plan would be, uh, th there is uh, inkling that they might increase the infra roads uh, budget to around 20 trillion till 2037. So uh, briefly talking about AVP Infracon, it's a micro company founded in 2009. Uh, they are mainly into road building uh, and they are right now mainly localized in uh, Tamil Nadu. Uh, their key projects include express highway, highways and bridges and urban development. 
as I said, primarily involved in Tamil Nadu. Their clients are right now Greater Chennai Corporation, National Highway Authority of India, and Tamil Nadu Public Post Department. It's uh, headed by uh, Prasanna Dan Danda Uttapani and Venkateshwaralu. They are both friends. When they met in college in 2001, I think, they are both... Uh, uh, he's 43 year old, Prasanna is 43 year old, and he's done his Bachelor of Engineering in Computer Science and Engineering from Bharati Dasan University. So he has gone through his entrepreneurial journey. He's had few failures. And uh, this uh, company was founded in 2009 as, uh, and was named as AV Papers. And uh, uh, later on, they ventured into infrastructure development, basically roads development. They also has a uh, ready mix concrete units. Uh, there were two to start with. And, and even in fact, last week, uh, they have started one more unit in Tamil Nadu. And uh, Venkateshwarlu is his friend and is a co-managing director of the company. He's even he's done his Bachelor of Engineering in Information Technology uh, from Bharati Dasan University, Tamil Nadu. And he's worked for a few companies and cooperative bank in Telangana and uh, as a network engineer. And he's a qualified CCNA professional. So these are brief uh, uh, snapshots of the company. Right now, the market cap is around 353 crores. Uh, PE is around 19.3, which is fairly reasonably valued for uh, this, this thing. Yeah. ROC and ROE is quite high. ROE is around 73% and ROC is 38%. Uh, debt to cash is less than one. And going forward, uh, there is no promoter uh, pledges and recently the ipo was came around in march and uh, there was no offer to sell uh, this thing everything what was collected went into the company and these are their uh, sales figures if you look at it they have increased uh, almost tripled when compared to 2021 from 58 crores of sales they have uh, this this year they have made around 155 151 crores mm -hmm. And their, their operating margin is quite decent, around 21% this year. Uh, interest uh, is fairly reasonable as well. And net operating margin is also quite decent for an infrastructure company. Uh, their three-year uh, compounded sales grew by 38%. And uh, profit growth is uh, three years is around 101%. So operating revenue has increased uh, by 40%, 39.91. And profit margins, uh, EBITDA margins have increased by 22.43 when compared to last year. And net profit margin has increased uh, of 11.6%. Uh, so these are the sales when compared to 21. They have, uh, in fact, tripled, as uh, previously said. And operating margin has quadrupled almost. This is the balance sheet. Uh, if you look at the uh, debt, uh, short term and uh, long term debt it's uh, the debt to equity is less than uh, it's around 0. 0.6 and uh, if you look at cash flows cash flow is a concern uh, as for any other infrastructure company uh, right now when we listen to the con call the answer given was because of the elections they were not able to uh, get the payment which was due and the management is quite uh, hopeful by within the next three, four months, this should uh, come under control. Because if, if you look at uh, the uh, this thing, receivables, it has increased quite a bit uh, to 53 crores when compared to last year. Interest payment and all is under control. And these are the clients of uh, AAP Infra. And uh, they have a subsidiary, as I told you, ready mix concrete, and they have three facilities as of now. The last one uh, was opened only on July 12th. Uh, they have one in Tirupur and Coimbatore. The recent was in uh, Tirupur district uh, in a small town called Merkur Totem. So the products offered under uh, ready mix concrete is uh, uh, con they have different uh, this thing self compacting concrete, fiber reinforced concrete. Uh, right through quick setting concrete as well. So they, they use this facility for in-house and they do uh, outsource this as well. And right now the uh, revenue from this is around 10 crores and with a profit of around one crore. 
going ahead once they have established the infrastructure company they want to build this uh, into a different company altogether so what are the strengths uh, they have till date executed around 40 projects and there are 15 projects uh, undergoing at the moment uh, the key aspect what attracted to this was their on time uh, uh, they, uh, they are very good with uh, project uh, completion and in fact uh, if you look at the all these infrastructure projects there is a 5% uh, clause where in few complete uh, the project within the time, you can have an additional 5% of the revenue. And uh, in quite a number of uh, projects, they were able to get that extra 5%, which has helped their revenue. And they have in-house capabilities. They have most of the machines uh, which uh, they have purchased. And uh, this uh, IPO money has uh, gone into uh, buying the infrastructure uh, related to this uh, uh, business and within a short uh, span of time at least in Tamil Nadu they have built a quite a big uh, reputation and uh, their uh, bid success ratio at this point in Tamil Nadu is around 40 to 45 percent which is quite good for a uh, infrastructure company and they have uh, most of the equipments as I told uh, right from uh, graders soil compactors pavers boom places Weaknesses, uh, as I told you, it's a uh, regional concentration. Major, in fact, all the uh, projects what they have completed till now is in uh, state of Tamil Nadu itself. Uh, right now, they are, uh, the plan this year is to bid for projects in Madhya Pradesh and Andhra Pradesh. And in fact, they have formed the JV with some of the companies in Andhra Pradesh and already bid for two projects uh, where the bid is yet to be opened. And as with any other infrastructure, uh, this is uh, government driven and any change of government, especially in Tamil Nadu, they will have a big impact on the uh, winnability of the projects and uh, execution. What are the opportunities? It's a small cap company and as such, this sector is a sunshine sector. And uh, for the next 10 to 15 years, at least, uh, we can be rest assured there will be a lot of investments uh, going on. Uh, but again, uh, as I said, is this the horse which we need to ride on? It is something which we need to uh, think about because the base is small as of now and the, the promoters are hungry. And hopefully, uh, you know, if we track this company and if uh, at the right opportunity time, if there is an opportunity, we can lag on. What are the threat is regulatory changes, as I said, change in government regulations, policies. And uh, as with any other big environmental uh, infrastructure project, environmental and so societal, uh, social risks are uh, this thing. Again, economic volatility, be being a, a small cap company, uh, bidding for large projects would be a challenge. And uh, skilled labor shortages is one of the things which we need to look into. Future outlook, as per companies uh, Concom, they're expecting a positive jump of 50% turnover in FY25. This is very conservative, uh, this thing, because they already have uh, projects uh, order book worth 300 crores, which majority of the order book would be completed this year itself. And they're quite hopeful of getting another order book of from 250 to 300 crores this year itself. So this is a very conservative estimate uh, what the as per con call planning to, and they are planning to expand beyond Tamil Nadu, exploring projects in other states like Madhya Pradesh and uh, Andhra Pradesh. Uh, and uh, they are considering the preferential allotment, allotment for fundraising after completion of one financial of, uh, of this financial year post IPO. Right now, the order book is around 300 crores, majority to be completed this year, expecting fresh order book inflow of 400 to 500 crores for FY25. Orders may range from uh, 18 to 24 months of for execution. Majority of projects to come from the road sector. Already, as I said, uh, they have formed JV uh, and have uh, bid for projects in Telangana. They are utilizing bank guarantees for project with a 5% escal escalation clause. And looking at the technicals, I mean, 
because uh, you know the ipo had come in march so there is nothing much uh, from technical point of view but if you look at uh, uh, here following the base breakout a small base was formed following the ipo it was listed at uh, 78 or something and uh, when you if you consider that it has already given you 1x uh, this thing, uh, while if you see the base, when you see the base breakout, the volumes are quite high and then it forms a consolidation. And from the consolidation, again, uh, this uh, increase in volume with increase in uh, share price. And right now it's consolidating at this level and uh, waiting for the next trigger. And if you see even in yesterday's and day before's uh, mid cap uh, meltdown uh, this uh, has uh, this it has not gone down below uh, 130 this thing and you can see a hammer being formed because the selling has been absorbed at the lower levels and even when it was going down you can see that the volumes are going uh, down as well and uh, volume speaking when the price moves up so thanks for the opportunity if there are any questions with regards to this. Thank you, Anupji. So it looks like a very good pick. Uh, one question that I have is any comparisons with the peer like uh, there are many road players in the infrastructure segment. So out of that, what is, if you have read about it, what is the specialty? So one company? Uh, company I looked into was Uday Shankar, which uh, they come, came up with the IPO last year. It's a Rajasthan based infrastructure company again. Uh, if you look at that, the operating margins of uh, AVP Infracom is quite high. I think the operating margins of Uday Shankar is around nine, eight to nine percent. But again, the sales of uh, them they, they they have nearly five hundred crores. Right now, AVP is around one fifty crores. Again, if you look at because uh, there's no point looking at bigger infrastructure companies like HD Infra, which are well established. But this is the only thing which I had a look around, a look looked at. And this is what I found. Order book wise, uh, do you have visibility over the next two to three years on this company? Uh, right now, they have an order book of 300 crores, which uh, the management is confident of uh, finishing this year itself. But they are quite confident of another 300 to 500 crores of uh, uh, winner, this thing order this year. And by 2026, uh, they want to be a 500. Uh, Revenues in sales and the order book of thousand crores. Okay, good. Yeah, guys, I I'm done with my questions. Anyone else wants to ask questions? Don't know. No questions for you Hanuk, at this Thank point you. of time. Anyone if has the questions, can you put in the chat so that he can look again and answer you. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you Anup, for the uh, initiative and taking up the presentation. Um, good. Okay, guys, uh, for the next part, uh, I thought of having the quiz initially at around 12, but I thought last time the attendance dropped in the second session, so we should have the quiz in the second session only instead of having it here. Maybe after the one or second round of presentation in the afternoon, we'll have that small quiz. And uh, we'll meet again possibly at one. We are done with the morning presentation three. And we can meet again at around 1 p.m. and start with Himanshu. Would that be fine for everyone? It's quite a good enough break, one hour, 10 minutes. Yeah, perfect, perfect, Punit. Uh, yeah. Okay, guys, then let's catch up at 1. Himanshu, you would be ready with that, possibly at that time. Thank I'll you. I'll be closing Thank you. the session for the time, maybe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.